Underwriting for Auto Line this week, provided by If you want to make things that move, move better, just talk to one of our scientists. They'll show you a special glue we've developed that bonds metal to plastic. And that makes the things you're trying to move lighter. The less weight, the less energy. And what you save can be used for speed, for efficiency, or just for fun. This is the Human Element at Work. Dow. From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on Auto Line this week, where the discussion is going to be all about automotive design, and that's because we've got one of the best in the business. Ralph Gilles, the head of all design at Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, FCA. Great to have you on the show here, Ralph. Here. Also joining us today, Eddie Alterman, the editor at Car and Driver Magazine, and Scott Burgess with Motor Trend Magazine. Great having the both of you here, too. Oh, thanks for having us. Uh, Ralph, I think we got to start out by saying, first of all, congratulations, man. You just got a mega promotion, head of design for the entire FCA group. My question is, you got all kinds of brands to deal with now. Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, Mopar, Fiat, Fiat Commercia, Alfa, Maserati. How are you going to deal with all this? Team. Number one is the team is solid, has been for a long time. You know, so really, you know, this global position is about oversight, really understanding what all the, all the different regions are doing and trying to bridge the two studios. We have two very good studios, excellent talent base there. Uh, I want them to, to have fun designing for each other. I think we're going to kind of take this brand thing uh, to a different direction. Um, now the what, cars, do you, what do you mean? The different? cars will always be made in market, of course, or in, in the country, but I think in the ideation phase, designers can sketch on anything. I mean, if you're a young designer, wouldn't you want that? You know, all these yummy brands you get to work on. So we're going to see how that goes. And I'm going to take a wait, you know, an uh, observational approach for the next few months and see what the opportunities are. But uh, I love uh, making the best of people. So we'll see. What's it like for an Italian, uh, an American guy to design <laughs> Italian American, Canadian. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Asian, Canadian. <laughs> I'm a mutt. <laughs> is, is there a difference in... Uh, um, or how would you describe the difference in Italian design philosophy to American well, design philosophy? Well, we're both very passionate. That's one thing I've, you know, we've been common law now for five years, so I've learned a lot about my, my friends in Italy. And I'm a longtime fan of Alphas. I mean, I've had Alphas myself personally. Um, I don't know if there's much of a difference. Uh, I think philosophically there's a little more emotion, you know, uh -huh. in the Italian design. When they speak about design, it's, it's very emotional. It's very... I mean, it's dramatic terms, ha lots of hand-waving, as you'd expect, you know? <laughs> and the Americans, it depends which car you're talking about, because there's a pragmatic side, there's a functional side, you know, family mobiles, and then there's the inevitable muscle car and whatnot. Um, but Italians will speak passionately about anything, <laughs> you know, whether it's a B-segment city car or a, you know, a fun car. So. Or is there any way that, um, or how do you want the brand identities to move? Yeah. That somebody looks at a town and country, they're not going to think alpha, you know, some people say what they, I'm already, you know, when some of our cars came out, they say, oh, look, the Italians influenced the new Charger. And that hasn't necessarily been the case, but I don't care. I think that's not a bad thing to have some cross-pollinization. But the brands, um, we take them very seriously. I mean, what Sergio has done by, you know, uh, putting brand shepherds in place, brand heads, brand CEOs, has done wonders for, for how we manage the brands. And what I love about, you know, we don't launch and leave anymore. We, we develop the cars, we keep feeding them, and, and that keeps underscoring what the brands are all about. Now... Um, will an Italian maybe design a Chrysler someday? Of course. That's okay. <laughs> you know, we have that today. We hire designers from all over the world. But even though you're hiring them from all over the year world, will the Italian design studio pretty much do the Italian design? Yes, and for the most part. But in the case of the, of the Renegade, for example, most of the ideation was done stateside. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. we got it to what we call a theme freeze in state. Then we handed the data over and it was engineered over there. And I flew some of my young designers for a few weeks at a time because we didn't want to get into the whole visa, you know, the expat thing. Um, and then some of their designers helped out with some of the details. And they loved it. I mean, they had Jeep posters all over their studios in Italy. And, and you, if you go to the plant in Melfi, the, everybody has Jeep logos on and Jeep everywhere. So they bought in and they love it. So I think it's a new world. I mean, it's Why do they love Jeep so much over in Europe? I mean, 1941, man. <laughs> Need you say more? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I was at uh, the New York Auto Show. I was amazed at how many Jeep Rubicons I saw parked on Fifth I Avenue. Know. I was floored at how many were there. Full roll cages, winches, <laughs> the whole nine yards. 
parked on Fifth Avenue. And also you can park on the sidewalk, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there any other brand besides Alpha, just in your estimation, that mm -hmm. has that kind of reach? That can go from a Maito all the way up to an 8C. It seems like the, there's so much bandwidth there. It's unique. I mean, I think Mercedes is doing a little bit of that. You don't see it as much stateside, but in Europe you see a lot of A and B segment Mercedes. BMW has dabbled in that, you yeah. know, and, and hides it in the Mini now. You know, but I, I think uh, Alpha's unique, and I think we haven't fully discovered what the brand can do. I think, you know, Harold and, and the Reed here are doing a nice job, um, and, and really waiting to see how the American public takes, you know, I mean, this summer's going to be a big year for Alpha, so we'll, we'll find out. What, what brand do you think needs your most of your attention right now? <laughs> I, I don't know yet. I, I, I'll be honest, I'll tell you in about six months. Right now I'm, in a, I'm learning a lot, uh, learning who the team is. I mean, I really have only dealt with the management level there, never really with the working level. So I want to get to know who they are. So I, and I, I'm really proud of what they do. I've, I've been there already several times. Uh, their interiors have come a long way. They've really upped the quality of the interiors. They know what they're doing. You know, it's not so much helping, it's more um, being more efficient. You know. Ralph, standing back and talking about design overall, recently there was a big argument between Bentley and Lincoln, oh, Bentley yeah. accusing Lincoln of ripping off yeah. its design. Yeah. This happens a lot in the industry. I'm curious, from a designer standpoint, where do you know where, okay, this is cool, we can use this, yeah. this element, but uh, if we do a little too much, we've stepped over the line. Yeah, and there's times when two design houses are working at different sides of the planet and end up showing up with the same thing just by fluke. You know, that has happened. Um, in that case, I didn't go to the New York Auto Show. I saw the pictures. I don't want to talk, you know. <laughs> you see what you want to see. You know, there definitely is some, some uh, I would say, cross-pollinization of ideas there. But, but proportionally, they're still quite different. Isn't it true, yeah. though, that the <laughs> American, that one, you know? <laughs> American luxury makers have been ripping off the great European marks for ages, bit. right? I mean, they accused that when a 300 came out, they said Baby Bentley was and the Seville first too. thing I heard. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, there's a certain, you know, what do you, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, you associate. Homage homage, you know, uh, paradigms that you right. associate to that. But. but where do you know the difference? Because there, we've seen some blatant rip-offs come out of China. Yeah. And yeah. yet then you get into this argument between, and I'm not asking you to comment on the Bentley yeah. or the Lincoln, but I'm just yeah. saying, how do you know as a designer, or is there a hard and fast rule? You know, you feel it, you know, and, and in what they do in, in some, it's less and less now in China, to be honest with you, you know, Shanghai show having happened. Um, you see it less and less. They're actually training designers now. They're hiring more designers. Some of them are, are even using Italian design firms or German you know, designers. Uh, so you're starting to see less and less of that, more unique design coming out of China. Uh, but you just sometimes it just happens. Sometimes what happens is a designer you know, goes from one company to another and has kind of his cadre of things he likes to do, and, and you see that theme show up in another company again. It happened to us in Mitsubishi times um, when we were with Mitsubishi. So it's, it's, it's a complex deal, but I think it's like you could accuse a lot of other industries of doing that. You know, the, the car is a hard, the hard points are very close. So sometimes you're going to trip on similar solutions. But not, I don't think it's, most of the time it's not intentional. Do you see these BRIC countries coming out with their own indigenous styles and applying that to the car? Or are we too, is it too early? I, I sure hope so. It'd be a shame for them just to emulate everything, you know, that they see. Uh, part of the problem is they have a lot of Western influence. A lot of Western companies are, are joining up with them, so naturally the cars look Western. And at least in, from what I understand about the Chinese market, they want the Western items. They love mm -hmm. the Western design. They, they love the Jeeps as they are. They love the, the BMWs as they are. Uh, they're proud of that. For them, it's, a, it's, it's aspirational to buy a, a, a... As we see the Chinese market becoming more important pretty soon, it'll be uh, larger than the U.S. market. Are Already gonna, is. Are we going to see that Chinification where now we're seeing Chinese leftovers <laughs> coming to the U.S.? I don't know. It's going to take a while. Brand-wise, it's going to take a long time. Americans are, and, and most markets are very, very loyal to brands. That's so going to take a long time to bust that. And we're setting up camp finally. We have a studio that's been operational for about a year in China. We're late to the party, in all honesty, um, but we're coming on strong. So. With uh, auto show season over, almost mm -hmm. over, what did you see this year that blew you away? Oh, I like the Paris show. That was my favorite show. Um, spent a lot of time in Paris. I like the cactus. I'm actually yeah. driving one around uh, southeast Michigan. If you see one out there, that's me. <laughs> the <laughs> Citroen cactus. It must be the only one in the country. Yeah, it is. I just like the, the clever solutions. You know, aesthetically, it is what it is. It's French. <laughs> but, but a lot of clever, very light car, 2,400 pounds or less, so pretty innovative. Uh, I like the new Spas. You know, yeah. I really thought that was handsome. Uh, the 500X was launched there. So um, I, I think what I like is the the animation of the compact SUV segment. There's a lot of great small, because when, you know, in the old days you bought a small car and it was a penalty box. You're like, ugh, I gotta drive this around. Today, it's aspirant, it's Kia fun. Kia Soul is so yeah. expressive, yeah. Renegade. 
Yeah. You know, only the HRV has sort of grown up, yeah. you know, or not. Yeah. So that's cool to see that. And, and then on the other end, of course, Geneva is supercar central. You know? Yeah. I'm almost dizzy every time I leave Geneva. Where's my, <laughs> where's my mortgage? Can we? You know? <laughs> Hey, we've recently yeah. seen uh, GM completely change the styling of the Volt, which will be yeah. out later this year, and they've made it more mainstream. And they're saying that the public does not want to have hybrids and electrics mm. that really look different. Mm. They've been sort of sales duds, not sort of. They've been totally sales duds. Yeah. What, what do you make of that? How would you style an electric or a, a, a a hybrid I think going they forward. did the right thing personally with the Volt, and I think it's just more handsome. I don't know if it's actually. I think on the road it'll look very futuristic still. Um, it's just a little easier on the eye. Uh, what happened to the current Volt? I think is they took a show car and couldn't execute and, and you know stayed true, tried to stay true, and ended up with kind of being halfway of nowhere. Um, I like the new Volt. I think it's going to do well, and it'll have broader appeal because you know, they're expensive cars. Hmm. And you get into that transaction point, and some people just you know want to look. Serious. Well, what's your, your, your thinking on design? Do, um, do EVs need to look mainstream or should they be different? I, I think they need to be unique. I don't think it's a matter of mainstream or not. The car, you, you, I think you fail when you have the same car that's one's an EV and one isn't, and you can't tell. Because the, the EV people, most of them want the world to know they've made the choice. So there has to be an outright evidence of it. But I don't think it needs to be weird. I, I think uh, designers almost try too hard. Now, the IA personally, we just were talking about that before we got on camera. Uh, I like it best when it's all black. I love the shapes mm -hmm. of it, but when it's blue, you know, the, the blue, black, and silver combined, it's trying way too hard. It's like, yeah, I don't like that. And that stuff typically ages very quickly. It looks cool on an auto show stand, good in a magazine, but then on the road for years after years, it's, it gets old. Yeah. Ralph, a lot of people don't realize that you're working so far in advance. Yeah, you know, you're working probably on 2018 cars mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. and, and further. Yeah. How do you, and how does your team know what's going to be fashionable and what's going to be trendy and what? What are the things that you want 2018 or further cars to look like? Wow, that's a very good question. We tend to, you know, you talk about auto shows. I, I actually look at that as the past. I don't look for inspiration auto shows because they happened four years ago. Most of those designs were even three years ago. Uh, we try to try to be tastemakers. Like the Cherokee is a really good example, right? We didn't look at anything. We just said we wanted, you know, we picked the most aggressive but still proportionally correct sketch we could. And it usually feels good. I mean, designers have hopefully have that kind of sound. Like a fashion designer just wants to set a trend. Uh, and we try our best. But it's hard when you're reusing architectures. You tend to be kind of trapped within the boundaries of, of certain things. Uh, and then when you have a strong brand, you know, I have to decide now, are we going to continue the certain look of a brand for a while? You know, Audi's famous for that. You know, now Mercedes is locked into a new look. Uh, that's a powerful thing, actually, because you don't have to remarket the brand all the time. So Unless it doesn't work, and then you have to Then you have to change right. gears, right? So, um, but then not all, you know, Jeep is unique in that way, because I would say you have the, the, the renegade Wrangler track, and then you have the Cherokee and Grand Cherokee track, which are more arrow swept looking. So that's something we're actually dabbling in right now is, is do we keep those two tracks? Do we converge them? You know, stay tuned. Do you guys <laughs> do a lot of generational research? And if yes. so, what does, it, what does it tell you? Wow. It tells us one thing is um, th th this bubble of millennials, which everyone's talking about millennials because they're the bigger than the boomers in terms of buying power. They're buying cars a lot later, and they're also very pragmatic. They're not showy people at all. Matter of fact, they... They see the car as an intelligent choice. Mm. Um, they'd only have the image needs of their parents at all. Uh, they'd rather have the simple one base model. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know? So it's going to be tough for us. How do you make money on a generation that doesn't want to spend a lot? You know, so that's Is why that I'm, because they're young and they just haven't? No, it's just what they're wired that way. They, they show their, they have other ways to express who they are. You know? and that, that's Man buns, <laughs> funny, funny facial hair. Exactly. Connectivity, you know, social outings, and things like that. Although Zipcar yeah. tells me that when millennials come in to use Zipcar, especially on college campuses, mm -hmm. they want cool cars. They don't want just anything on the lot. Now, that's different. There, there's definitely still enthusiasts. I'm actually, when I drive my car around, I get thumbs up from young kids. I'm like, wow. So there's, there's still a core of, of enthusiasts. There's just a lot of them, that's all. Yeah. You know, I think there's, everyone thinks, oh, kids don't like cars. It's not true. There's, we have research finds there absolutely is an enthusiast sector out there. There's just so many of them. So as you look way into the future, autonomous cars, have you yeah. given any thought to that? And how do how you could you not? Everyone's talking about it. Yeah, it's, but, it's, but I'm talking from a design <laughs> standpoint, especially the interior. What if yeah. you can get rid of the steering wheel and the pedals and all that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's still in the sci-fi range because it, it's possible. I mean, cars almost do it now. I mean, there's certain cars you can put your hands off. You know, today's chair can go like this for at least 10 minutes until yeah. it gets more. 10 seconds, it gets mad at you. you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to change. I, I think it's not imminent, though. I think it's more than five years from now for mm -hmm. a truly, like, you you know, the Jetsons where you, you lounge, you read your paper while you go to, well, now you read your iPad, whatever it is, <laughs> and you right. get driven to work. 
Uh, so we'll see. I'm excited by it. I think um, it's probably more topical than it is real, to be honest with you. Uh, it's, it's trendy to talk about. But Could I you improve the look of the Google car? <laughs> 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 but I think they purposely designed it to be anti, mm -hmm. you know, anti. Would you make it look more like a squirrel than a koala? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would you do with it? <laughs> no, not, not touching that. Okay, so okay. we've got uh, these global regulations yeah. getting more and more intense. Fifty-four point yeah. five miles yeah. per gallon in the United States, under a hundred gram CO two in Europe. Yeah. Is the wind tunnel going to end up dictating too much? We've heard this argument for decades, but now it's getting really serious yeah. from an aerospace. We're standpoint. realizing the wind tunnel isn't the only. We've been actually using the wind tunnel more than ever. I mean, our modern cars are four or five times more time in the tunnel than ever, right? But that's a finite. There's, after a while, you can't make the car any smaller or any slipperier. It's more about the systems now, integrating the systems together. Powertrain's really got the biggest headache, and, and the metallurgy team, you know, the component team. Uh, how to find weight. And cars, I think, if you've noticed, have peaked in weight and are starting to get lighter. Mm -hmm. And will continue to get lighter and lighter and lighter. Uh, but sometimes it costs money to go light. So And they seem to be getting bigger and taller. And how do you visually minima minimize like some the of, height? And well, some of that's the cafe rules. Actually, favor, in the U.S., favor a bigger car. If you look at the way they calculate the footprint of the car, they actually want you to, to make a bigger... It's just counterintuitive. So. Yeah. So in some ways, you're going to see, that's why there's this huge movement to CUVs, because it's a little easier to hit the targets with a CUV, and the consumers like CUVs. Yeah. So um, very interesting times, I mean, for, for all of us, not just design, I think for the, the entire engineering, the automotive community, it's head scratching. Let's talk about some trends. We've seen uh, in the last decade, fender vents yeah. exploded. They're everywhere. And now, I, I, am I right? Am I seeing them starting to go away? What, what do you think? I, I, they should be on where you need them or on performance cars. You know, and I think you know, I think when they're decorative, it kind of bothers me a little bit. But, but it's, it depends on the proportion. If you have the room, they stick them in there like the new Lincoln show car. Has. <laughs> I think it's going to be fender vents now. You see the GT3 RS. As long as they're not peel and stick, the ones that you know, people put on there. <laughs> How about big, bold grills? We've seen a huge move into that. Yeah. In the pickups, I understand, but we've also seen it in cars with big badges, gigantic yeah. badges. Yeah. Where, where do you think the it's trend like, in that's I mean, going? We just did on the 300. We went back. We added 33%. We actually, someone asked us, we actually figured out it's about 33% bigger than the interim one and slightly bigger than the original one. So it's a long view, right? From you know, 100 feet away, ah, that's a, that car. I think that's fun to play with. I think uh, uh, we, in some of it's the PED Pro rules. Right? The PED pedestrian impact rules require a more blunt front end than what you do with all that space. So when we thought it was going to get sleeker and sleeker for aero, now we need PED Pro, which stands up the front end. So it's made for quite a challenge. Um, Where's technology yeah. uh, changing design, such as lights? We're seeing you know, a, a lot more animated front ends with uh, uh, Interesting. LEDs and... There's a point of passion with me because what I've noticed is today's lighting standard is keeps going up and up. Where you know what consumer reports con considers great lighting is much more aggressive. You know, mm -hmm. a, a car design five years ago had great lights, no longer has great. Even the best cars. So projectors are going away, and uh, LED projectors are now the thing. LED reflectors are really the hot ticket now. Um, they're they're nice and packageable for designers. They're really compact. They're very light, um, but they're still on the expensive side. So it's something that we're looking at. But LED technology is not only here to stay, but you're going to see it from every price class. It's not going to just be the premium cars anymore. What about lasers? Because I know in Europe they've... Lasers are only useful for very high speed and high distance. They're too powerful, actually. You can actually hurt retinas. <laughs> you, can, you can injure other drivers. So if, they, if you look at who's using it, it's Audi for the Autobahn. It's really meant for you know 150 mile per hour cruising, where you need a fine point of light very far away. You don't think that'll... It's over. Family. No, you can diffuse it, but it's it's almost just to say you have laser lights. The, the LEDs are so effective. Yeah. Is there any mm -hmm. kind of move toward abandoning the kind of classical symmetry of the car? I mean, you know, there's always been the face. There's always been a kind of recognizable. Yeah. I remember being in school, and there was a period where this asymmetrical car was the hottest thing. You know, and, and cars started to look like Dali paintings and right. you know, all like contorted <laughs> <laughs> Picasso cars. You know, and, and it'll come back. It's like fashion. Someone's going to break it out. I think you can do it in in a classy way, and if you do it beautifully, people will respond. I think the industry's definitely. Uh, needs a shake-up right now. There's a lot of beautiful cars, a lot of handsome cars. You know, no one. How would you shake it up? Oh man, if I told you. <laughs> uh, well, give us some directional ideas I mean, of what you're of talking it, about. At least personally, for me, was was trying to get the cars handsome and tidy and high quality looking. I think we're pretty much got that sussed out now. Next is being impressive without um, 
without being weird. I mean, if you go to weird, your volumes go way down. Mm -hmm. There's a magic line where people like something expressive. And the Renegade to me is right on the edge. You know, we, we made, it, made it have a personality, outsized personality. So I want to continue that, where cars have that almost like a person does. You know, some people you meet, they're immediately they're animated. You, you remember them because they're just so much, you know, there's something about them, their eyes are big or whatever. I want cars to have that feeling. But you just got to be careful. If you make it too cute, it's just you narrow your focus, so it's just a struggle. But at the at the end of the day, like the, especially with the Chrysler brand, that's about beauty, timeless, gorgeous beauty. I mean, to me, I, there's a place in time to to fool around. If your brands are strong, your cars are well made, you don't have to go nuts. You know, you don't mm -hmm. have to go crazy with design. How about materials too? You know, uh, as you mentioned, cars are getting yeah. lighter, i.e., a lot more carbon fiber showing up. Yeah. It's been trim up to now, by and large. Now we're yeah. starting to see structural aluminum. There's some wild stuff that can be done with glass, even. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so talk a little bit about what materials might be it's doing. It's kind for of you. everything. Uh, glass, you mentioned now. There's composite glass. You know, for for a long time, uh, plastic made bad windshields and bad backlights because of scratching. Now they've they found a way to put a plasma coating or something on it that that does that, and that's a huge weight savings. I mean, the the weight of the car, most of it, a lot of it's in the glass. Um, that's coming. Uh, aluminum stamping technologies obviously uh, is arrived. We used to have to sacrifice radii when you dealt with aluminum. And ironically, the steel industry is nervous because they're like, wait a minute, yeah, how about us? And they're kicking butt right now. now high strength steel, very thin steels that are very precise. And steel is still one of the most interesting metal because it's 100% recyclable. It's very easy to deal with. It's cheap. Uh, so this, I don't think steel is out. I think you're going to see cars that have everything. I mean, it's happening already. You know, where you have, usually the closures can be aluminum, the doors and hood are easy to deck lid, and then the car itself is still high strength steel because it's hard to beat. It really is. So. What kind of design freedom does a, a layout like a Tesla give you, where it's a sandwich floor? A lot. More than they use. I think they could have gone, and that's the idea of not being too weird, right? Because a right. Tesla could have easily been much more progressive because they have nothing to work around other than a battery tray and small motors. Um, so we'll see. I'm interested to see where they go, you know, in the future when you don't have to deal with an engine and a, and a, and a radiator and all you that. You still stuff. have to crash and all that. Yeah. But and you need the crumple zones. I mean, there's definitely a minimum distance between the, the feet and the bumper. <laughs> right. <laughs> and people, you know, with aero, you got to put the people in there and then the luggage and, you know. What should a, a, a layman be looking for in design changes? You know, the, the latest thing is all dash to axle talk. Yeah. Yeah, cars are going to, I mean, the wheelbases will get longer um, because of the cafe, especially in the States, American cars. Americans, specific market cars, will, will extend to get longer wheelbases uh, and space inside. I think uh, of the value proposition of space still turns on people. Mm -hmm. they, even though if you're not paying a lot of money, they want a big back seat. And, and I don't know what that means styling-wise. I mean, arrows a constant now. Uh, characters are constant. But I think um, unbelievable technology for the money is here to stay. I mean, it's a time to get a car nowadays. You, know? you think there's more exciting stuff happening at the lower end of the market or the higher end of the market? I think it's more competitive. I mean, it's competitive. I mean the luxury part's where you make the money. I mean, a lot of brands are, are trying to really exist at the luxury end. But the entry is, is where you kind of get your, it's where you scoop the people into your brand, right? So uh, there's a great fight going there. And, and outside of the U.S., it's a hot market still. You know, the, the B and the C and A markets are still heavy. Hard to make money there because they're getting now... Um, Chock full of technology. Yeah, the content and, and yeah, the safety and economy. And the seven airbags in, in most small cars now. I mean, it's just everything's got heated seats tough. and satellite yeah. radio and power everything. Yeah, Ralph, we keep hearing in the auto industry of how hard it is to recruit mm -hmm. the best and the brightest mm -hmm. out of business schools. You know, they all want to go to Silicon Valley or uh, Wall Street. What, what's it like on the design side? It's, it's very similar. I mean, especially when they're straight out of school, they want to live somewhere cool. We're finding, though, when, they, when it's time to put their roots down, the Midwest sounds really good, you know, because <laughs> the cost of living is far, far better. And if you look at Cupertino, where Apple and, and those guys are, it's impossible to live there. I mean, the cost of housing is out of control. Uh, so that's kind of helped on our side in a way. Um, the other thing we try to tell new hires when they come to the, you know, you're going to travel. I mean, designers have passports that are stamped a lot, you know, because you get to auto shows, you get to do research clinics, you get media launches. I mean, it's really, you may have an address in Michigan, but you're going to do a lot more. Um, the other end of things is the, is the electronic, you know, the animators, because our, our infotainment systems, and most cars now are screens, right? No mm -hmm. gauges anymore. Um, and finding talent to make that stuff is tough. Everybody is scrambling for the same skill set. Uh, so it's, it's tough. Tough to keep them when you have them, tough to get them. And a lot of kids aren't, they know it's a career yet, so it's tough to even find them at all. You know? 
but that's a big part of the industry. How competitive is it? Uh, do you have to keep fending off your competitors yeah. trying to poach your yeah. talent? And it, you know, Ed Welburn and myself, you know, we go to CCS, we're like looking at each other and trying to walk faster. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I want him, I want him. Yeah. So it's, it's a great time to be a designer and, and in, the, in the industry in general. I mean, young calibrators, integrators, we call them integrators, system integrators are worth their weight in gold. These are the people that get the car to talk to itself. I mean, there's so many modules in a car and code writers. I mean, it's a very... It's is like, that happening at the design schools now? Is it no, that's kind of engineering schools. Okay. And some of that happens on the job. That's the issue. You get these, these young kids, they become trainees, they, stick, they learn the craft for two, three years, and then they're, valuable. they're even more valuable. Right? It's like finishing school. And that's the same issue over in Europe, too? Pretty much the same Every, situation? Everywhere. It's less the case, I mean, obviously in Germany. I think the studios are further apart. You know, in Michigan, we're, we're stones throw away from each other. Uh, but you're getting a lot of people going to China now. You know, they're offering some, some incredible salaries to, to live in China. So. Wow. And it's still the big three schools, Art Center, CCS. No, there's, there's some in Europe, college. Coventry. Um, there's uh, one, a new one in uh, Korea, a new one, I forget the name of it, and one in China. It's pretty, there, there's more than that. There's about eight of them throughout the world in Academy of Art in San Francisco. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, your biggest priority right now, we're, <laughs> we're getting down to the end, uh, so it means sort of a quick answer. There's but, so many, oh wow. And I know you wanted to sit yeah. back and I'm, I'm gonna observe, which I think is a smart approach to yeah. it, but what do you think is your top priority? Um, got it, can't fail. I mean, uh, we got, uh, the Alpha brand's a big assignment. Um, it's well underway. I mean, Lorenzo did a fantastic job with, with the car you'll see this summer, but there's more to be born and I'm, I'm gonna have to roll up my sleeves and get with that, and that's exciting. I mean, I never, Young kid from Montreal, I never would have thought I'd be working on this. So uh, hats off to Sergio giving me this shot. And, and it shows how well the companies are integrated. There's no, we're colorblind, we're, we're where you come from blind. It's just about who's got the gumption to do it. You know? That's real, way cool. With that, we're going to have to wrap this up. Ralph Jules, thanks so much for coming on AutoLine this week. Awesome having Pleasure. you here. Really good. Eddie Alterman, Scott Burgess, great having yeah. the both of you here, too. Thanks for your help on all this. And I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by. When it comes to meeting global mandates for fuel economy, Dow Automotive Systems is leading the way. We're the only supplier offering lightweighting capability supported by epoxy resin systems, structural, aluminum, and composite bonding adhesives, acoustical foam technologies, and carbon fiber systems that, when combined, work together as a complete solution. And our award-winning lightweight bonding solutions can be found in many vehicles on the road today. Affordable solutions from Dow Automotive Systems.